Welcome to Wisdom Talk Radio, a collaborative community of explorers in conscious living. TEDx Talks from Within a Prison? Well, that's one way you transform violence. Join me for today's guest, Mariette Formue du Sartel, on today's episode of Wisdom Talk Radio. She has heart-opening things to share. Hi, I'm Laurie Seymour, host of Wisdom Talk Radio, founder of the Baca Journey, and mentor guide for those who are on the cusp of their next step, personally, professionally, spiritually. You want to know how to connect with the answers that await you when you go inside because these are the answers that unlock who you truly are. Mariette Formue du Sartel guides leaders to build sustainable, resilient, high-performance teams, enabling them to develop innovative solutions to world-scale problems. In that very vein, Mariette has discovered the mechanisms of turning our society's cycle of violence into one of transformation and healing with the organization of the wildly successful TEDx Donovan Correctional. She has created a nonprofit called Brilliance Inside with the mission of transforming prison from being strictly a container of violence to a creator of peace. She is truly a global citizen. Born in France, she's lived on four continents and has explored some of the most remote corners of our world. Welcome, Mariette, to Wisdom Talk Radio. Thank you, Laurie. It's a joy to be here. Absolutely. And it's a joy to have you here. Mm -hmm. I met you in the end of January, I think it was. And, you know, when I started hearing some things about what you're about and who you are and what you're doing, I said, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, I I need to have her on Wisdom Talk Radio. (laughs) And it's taken us till now to get here, but we're here. (laughs) <laughs> and it's all in perfect timing. <laughs> so you're working in such an, uh, an unusual way. Um, yeah, and you're working to break our society's cycle of violence. So how, you know, how did you, how did this come about? How did, how was this birthed? And, you know, why for you was prison the place to start? it wasn't the place to start for me (laughs) Mm -hmm. and um at all i was called into prison almost four years ago and um one day sitting on my cushion meditating um if anything asking for some support in coming to um, increase, you know, how do you say, like coming to a greater level of peace. Mm-hmm. And, um, and in my meditation, in the clearest of voices, I heard three words that changed my life. And those three words were, go to prison. Wow. And um, like any person who has nothing to do with the world <laughs> and is working in corporate America and um, living a life of, um, you know, technological advancement and culture change um uh, no (laughs) you mean prison inside am i supposed to be yeah (laughs) and um, oh no no that was not no that was i know you were clear clear. um, that might have been my question so um and so yeah so i i like you know like i would say like most normal people um resisted it and said yeah no no no. i think you got the wrong person i don't think you you know this is this is all wrong um i've dedicated my life to poverty alleviation why are you sending me to prison no 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 um and and yet um in all of this resistance um what i call the gremlins mm-hmm. i had this strong inner fire which ironically was also the stillest most calm most deep place of me that kept saying, just trust, just go, just take the next step. That is how it goes, isn't it? Yeah. And so that's what I did. I just, every time took an additional step and every time I'm like, this is berserk and this is crazy and yet let's do it. And, um, 
And so took the steps and found myself inside the local prison here in San Diego, which by the way, I found out it existed by Google because didn't know a thing about the space. <laughs> so I Googled prisons in San Diego, which at that, that day thought, I thought it was the most hilarious thing in the world to Google. I've since then Googled a lot more crazier things. <laughs> <laughs> but that was your next um, <laughs> And um, but yeah, so, so here in, locally in San Diego, which is where I live right now, um, there's a state prison named Donovan. And so I um, found my way into Donovan uh, in December 2015. And, um, and I'll remember that first day uh, forever because I, you know, I'm going to prison with a, um, you know, with, with someone that I had met and, uh, and we walk, you know, we go through the security check and then the second security check and we walk through those gates that officially make us like, you know, kind of we're in the prison facility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they clang shut behind us and I suddenly feel completely at home oh my goodness and so i'm like well this is not what i expected <laughs> no. and so um had a phenomenal experience that first day talking to um, a number of different residents and uh and when we walked off the yard um the that person i was with um ended up telling me my this cannot be your first time in prison I said, yes, it is. He's like, not, you're not acting like it's your first time in prison. I'm like, I know, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, he told me about a pastor that was going there for services the next day. I called him up to, because I was like, I was like, I need to figure out more about the space. So I went the next morning with this pastor and his wife, who just hearing my 10 minute story about what, you know, just my mundane experiences of talking to some dudes dressed in blue, because the incarcerated in California wear blue. Um, um, he turns to me, he's like, Mariette, you're a lifer. And I told him, I don't even know what that means yet. And yet, yes, I am. And so... What does that mean? Well, lifer is a term used for people who have li a life sentence in prison. Oh, okay. So it is what I thought it was, but... And, um, and, and you know, and again, that now, now with the hindsight, I can acknowledge the fact that I'm absolutely lifer. I joke with the guys that, you know, as much as they're working to get out of prison, I've been working really hard to stay inside prison. Hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, yeah, so, so, you know, kind of fast forward a little bit, um, you know, the, the, that, that absolute unbelievable richness in humanity, you know, that, that I discovered in these men that let's be honest, some of them have done some pretty heinous, atrocious, whatever label we want to put mm -hmm. on things, um, was just astounding to me. The, the, their, their humanness, the, the, the um, compassion that they expressed, their desire for constant, constant growth and uh, was astounding to me. And, as, as, and I thought, if I am so unfamiliar with this, others are likely to. And that's what spontaneously led me to, or, well, I have a, I'm a big TED junkie, so wanting to let, lead me to organize a TEDx inside, inside those walls. Wow. And so that's, that's the journey to organizing a TEDx inside prison but uh, somehow the idea of doing that i mean you didn't you didn't know what you were going to do there or you didn't have a feeling about i mean you had to be there okay that's step one or or step 60 i don't know um but then what came next before the idea of the tedx i mean just that's it that, that was the next you, idea wow okay when was the first tedx done so um, it takes a little time to organize things inside a prison. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and on top of that, my, my number one key element I wanted to make sure uh, we stay true to was that this event was not going to be organized by people on the outside and brought in, into the prison. This mm -hmm. event was going to be organized by the men themselves. And, uh, and so we worked with the administration and, and devised all the systems around this so that this could happen. And in December of 16, met with the people we call our core team, the men who are actually going to organize the event for the first time. And we selected those men off applications where we asked, for example, a question of, you know, um, what skills and capabilities do you believe you'll be bringing to this experience? And one of the guys wrote, literally, I have no skills and capabilities to bring to this experience. Hmm. And so those are the types of applications we received of, um, gosh, I don't remember how many received them because now we've received so many applications since then. But, um, but we, we selected 10 men to be part of our core team. And, 
and met them. And we have some that are like, you know, bubbly little chatterboxes and um, some of them have, um, a few of them have seen TEDx talks. Mm -hmm. None of them have any clue what a TEDx event even means. Um, some of them are, you know, as I often say, kind of these ro literally rolled up in the ball, um, can't take their eyes off the floor, people in the corner of the room, and we're lucky if they say just one sentence to us. Mm -hmm. And it's just with this group of, of misfits, if you will, of societal, no, no good societal throwaways, you know, of multiracial, um, you know, tough dudes that we start organizing the first event. Wow. And they really, we really put all the decisions in their hands. Uh, and, and so from, you know, who we're going to be the speakers and how we're going to select them and the selection process and who's, who's in the audience and, and what percentage of, you know, what, what percentage of people are going to be from the inside, what percentage from the outside, what are they eating, what are the experiences around the talks, um, you know, just the entire outline of the day. Uh, and, and every single minutia detail about it as much as possible is led by the men, of course, always approved by the administration because it remains prison mm -hmm. and, um, but, but led by the men. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that was an important component to me. And in that process, we, we got to see these people who like that guy who, um, you know, was rolled up in the ball. Um, soon we discovered he was a six foot four man and that he had brown eyes. I'm like, oh, look, look at your eyes. <laughs> nice to see them. <laughs> um, he actually became one of our, one of our speakers and um, took a big leap of faith on himself and, and wow. big confidence, you know, um, um, yeah, trust of himself to, to, um, to become a speaker and delivered a phenomenal talk uh, that I'll say this just because I, I love saying this about him. Um, when, when he delivered his talk, uh, a CEO that was in the room came to me later and said, you would have put a suit on that guy. I would have thought that he was a, um, a CEO of a fortune 500 company. Mm. He has the poise and the, um, the confidence and the poise of a corporate CEO, CEO. My goodness. So you had the first TEDx. What did you discover? And what did you, you know, what, what did it mean? It meant a lot, I'm sure, to them in different ways, to the men that were part of it. But what did it mean to you? So I, I witnessed in just a few hours a radical, radical transformation. And of course, in the core team that had put their heart and soul into organizing this event, uh, but also in the other men in blue, as I call them, mm -hmm. who um, the, the hundred men in blue who were um, volunteering to um, support the event as well as were attendees, uh, who you know, said in our closing circle when we invited people to just share in popcorn style things like, in my 20 years of incarceration, I've never been seen as human until today. Wow. wow. And then the outside attendees who themselves talked about a radical life-changing experience on the day of, but continue to reach out to me and give me stories of, of, of transformation in their lives. And so a couple months ago, um, I, someone told me, actually someone who's coming to prison to meet the men tomorrow, um, told me that uh, after coming to prison and talking about his experience with his family, his daughter uh, if you will, called him out saying, dad, how can you talk so eloquently and so powerfully about the rehabilitative potential of these men and believe in the death penalty? And, mm -hmm. and he's realizing, you know, kind of how his heart is shifting because of what he's experienced. Yeah. You know, I just posted on Facebook a couple of days ago, the story of um, the VP of D development at the food bank, the San Diego food bank, receiving a letter from a Donovan uh, resident um, donating $10 because um, he himself was part of the problem and now wants to be part of the solution. How he remembers being hungry as a kid and he wants to be able to help in the little tiny ways he can, even though he makes only 65 cents an hour. And, um, 
And she, she shared this with me and I was so moved because she talked about how on top of that, now other Donovan residents are starting to donate five, $10 to the food bank. And she wrote, I truly believe this is a ripple effect of the work that you're doing. Uh, and so from the personal transformations people have experienced to the ripple effects they're, they're, they're telling me about, it's profound. And so those com combinations with the combined effect of the impact it's had on the Donovan administration um, had me floored, absolutely floored. And it was all exemplified in one moment in, in the, um, in that, at the end of that first event. So to give a little bit of context, um, prison is a place full of really tough guys. And, yeah. and these are guys who are, when, every time I go out in the yard, they are working out because they need to be pumped up. Mm -hmm. And um, and not only do they need to be physically pumped up, but they are just the kind of guys like one of my guys who had his first gun like by the time he was about ten, and I don't believe he lived without a gun until he would lo was locked up, you know. And if you're living with a you know a gun stuffed in the back of your pants, how do you think that changes the way you're you're acting in the world? And most of them have this attitude of you're not going to mess with me. And, um, and that's what they want to portray and convey in everything that happens in, in, in their environments. And second of all, it, prison is, a, is an environment that's extremely, extremely race divided. Um, there's the blacks and the whites and the Hispanics and the, uh, the Asians, and they cannot mix. Mm -hmm. And mixing has severe, severe consequences that can go all the way to death. And, um, and so it's not just the, the fear of having multiracial attacks, which happens, you know, but also same race attacks. Uh, you know, if you ever were to show any kind of disloyalty or even a, a you know, hint at it, um, there's risks there. And so where there's a place where you have a table for the blacks and a table for the whites and a table for the Hispanics, uh, for them to come together in, in a, um, in a, you know, open way is, is unheard of. And so with those two norms underlying the entire culture of prison, um, at the end of our, of our event in the, in the closing circle, our, and I called, I called our core team that had organized the event quite invisibly to all of our attendees um, to the center of our circle. And as I'm acknowledging them, they spontaneously fall into each other's arms. And so here we have in a, in a space where tough guys rule the game. And if you show anything other than toughness, you're in for it. Where on top of that, race is one of the strongest dividers. This multiracial group falling into each other's arms, surrounded by their peers. I mean, I'm, I'm still getting goosebumps. It's, it's been two years and I still get goosebumps. And, you know, I sat there being like, what just happened? And, and I turn, I see the director of mental health was tears streaming down her face because of the incredible counterculture manifestation that was. And, and that if that happened in that environment, it meant the guys felt safe enough to express that part of them and, and in among their peers, much more so. And, and the beauty has been that that has only expanded since then. And so that's what transformed me is be like, wow, if we're able to create that kind of safety and that kind of human connection and, and that kind of healing in just five months, what could happen in five months of part-time, what could happen if I were to invest myself fully into this? And that's what led me to create Brilliance Inside. Uh, wow, I mean, I have so many questions that are bubbling up in me. Um, let me just see where I need to go with this. Um, well, first of all, the administration, it sounds like, got to see this transformation. They got to witness it and, and without being able to dismiss it. Is that true? Without mm -hmm. being able to what? To dismiss it. Oh, um, well, so yes, like, you know, one of the stories I love to share about this is um, the warden at the time hadn't been involved in, in, in the planning or organization of this at all. Of course, he'd approved everything, mm -hmm. but had not been in the conversations um, leading up to the organization of, of this event. So, so when he came in and actually participated in the event, he was coming in, quote, cold. 
um, and having learned the, you know, all the administrative things he had to sign off on, <laughs> but not necessarily um, having heard all the, I'll use the word heart pieces that had happened behind this. And, and, and for the fact of the matter is, I don't know how much he had heard of that piece. And but the story I love um, is that after the event, uh, I, I, I saw the warden and he was like everyone else, quite flabbergasted. Mm-hmm. And he told the one, this one story to others. It wasn't to me. He told this one story to others, but I was there when he told me. He's like, this is what I saw Mariette do. And it was actually in um, uh, the, um, the part of the day where the outside attendees get to engage with the inside attendees in these small four pod, um, we call them TED expression pods. And, uh, and so it's four person pod, excuse me. And, and so this is happening and I'm sitting there just watching the whole thing, um, basking it, to be honest. And, and the warden's not too far from me. And at one point, one of the guys from our core team comes to me and says, Mariette, we have a problem. I said, okay, what's the problem? And this grabs it. And I honestly don't remember what happened. This is related back from the warden. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, I, and so the guy describes the problem and I'm like, well, it's your event, my friend. What do you want to do about it? And he explains what he thinks we, we should do about it. And I'm like, sounds good. Go off and do it. And, and to me, that was a mundane little moment. And it wasn't until the warden like, emphasized to people he was talking to, like, I have never seen that happen in this environment where the men are given the power of choice. <sighs> and it's so rare in this environment. And I realized the power of that story because he kept repeating it to many different people that he, that, that, you know, he engaged with. And, um, you know, and so, so he, you know, and, and another piece that happened with him was that we talked about the fact that um, the thing I was hearing everywhere from the correctional staff and from his staff was, yeah, 250 people in a room together and half inside, half outside and not one incident. And I turned to the warden, I'm like, you mean other than the tens of thousands of positive incidences that happened that day? <laughs> and he, he again had a moment of like, oh yeah. And because, you know, again, they, they live in an environment where for the most part, they're being asked to track the negative. Of course. Of and course. which, you know, again, makes complete sense. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, when we are, when we're called to measure one thing, we can lose sight of the other things or discount them. And, um, and so it really shifted his perspective uh, on, you know, being able to see and acknowledge the other side of the coin as well. And that's so um, important. That's so, that's so essential. I think that's why I felt moved to ask you about that because it's easy to, to stay stuck in the old paradigm. And there's something you're, and in a way you're creating, I think, a whole new paradigm. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Simply put, I have to admit, yes, I am. And, so, and, the, and the beauty of it is to do so with them, not mm-hmm. in opposition to them. And that's been my, like, you couldn't. You couldn't do it in opposition. Because that's from the, the beginning thing. is that Fair it is enough. with them and and with at the table constantly in conversation mm-hmm. co-creation and um and 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 it's to be safe for everyone at all times mm-hmm. and and i tell our guys this all the time is that our space is to be safe for all at our time all times and that means for all not just the people who are in the circle mm-hmm. but everyone who is not in the circle as well and so it doesn't mean that there's no room for any kind of you know finger pointing or expression of, of frustration or even anger, that's, of course, there's room for that. And there's room for that in the space that we then, you know, he or we work on transforming that into a space of, of healing. So hurt has space for expression as long as it can come and turn into healing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and the healing that you are, are part and parcel of I, I love how you're talking about it as a kind of from the, from the inside out, but from the inside of letting everybody be a participant, having choice and the, and the power of choice being such a key element. And then how does everybody contribute to that awareness that we are keeping and making this safe? Well, and, and that comes back to, you know, even the name of the nonprofit, which is Brilliance Inside. Mm-hmm. 
with the strongest belief that everyone, no matter our circumstances, has brilliance inside. So as much as someone can have hurt us, we, we're annoyed at them, we're, you know, we have tremendous anger or rage even towards them, that um, there's remorse and guilt there, um, you know, uh, and all those emotions that can happen. Mm -hmm. you know, how can I see the brilliance in myself in that moment and the brilliance of the other in that moment? Yeah. The way I talk about that, and I think it, it relates to it, is God is here inside of me and God is there inside of you. Mm -hmm. And that willingness to see that is really seeing that brilliance inside and feeling that about oneself at the very same time. Mm -hmm. So that really starts to um, dissolve judgment, uh, separation. Uh, so that's why I particularly I feel so inspired by your talk about um, the race divisions just going. So you, I know I've, I've heard you say this, and I, I want to ask you about this, about because um, it is true for me, that love is the ultimate answer. So say something about that. And what, really what you've seen, how you've seen that. Prison is a space of tremendous hurt. Prison is also a space of dehumanization and degradation. Prison is a space of opposition, separation, and isolation. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of the activities that happen in that space, a lot of the behaviors, a lot of the beliefs stem from those, I don't know what to call them, energy, spaces, beliefs, um, labels. And what I have seen time and time and time again is that when we create that safe space, where people are allowed and even encouraged to step into their own brilliance. But here's what my belief is in our brilliance, is that our brilliance is within us, has always been, you know, is that God-given gift unique to us that I truly believe we were born with. And so there's no need to go hunt for it. There's no need to go create it. What we ha have a need to is to let go of the stuff that's come and like tarnished it or hidden it or dimmed it. Mm -hmm. and, so, uh, and so when we talk about uncovering our brilliance inside, it really is a work of reconciling with the beliefs and the thoughts and th that have dimmed that brilliance. And that is only possible if we reconcile with the people and the stories that created those beliefs. And even though we never use this term in our space, that ultimately is a work of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Forgiving of ourselves, forgiving of others, forgiving of situations, forgiving of you know, what we had perceived to be completely out of our control. You know, forgiving of the cards we were dealt, forgiving our, of our inability to address the situations we were in in other ways than through anger and violence, mm -hmm. um, forgiving you know, every single component that dims that, that brilliance. And, uh, and that ultimately is an act of love. Mm -hmm. It's an act of love of ourselves and it's an act of love, love of others. And, um, and so that's what, you know, when we go dig underneath all these layers, why to me, it's all about love being the ultimate answer. And so, and the guys, it's so much fun, you know, again, you know, I, I, I now spend my days hanging out with some really, really tough guys. <laughs> um, and, you Who know, and it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, no kidding. And, um, 
And, you know, just, uh, this is going to be completely out of context, but just to show kind of the space, like, you know, like one of our guys, um, the second time at the second TEDx last year gave a talk called from gangster to grace mm. and talking about him. Um, another one of the men on the core team said, Mariette, we have killers talking about being butterflies. You know, and that's the space we have. We have killers talking about being butterflies and, and who actually step into and through, most importantly, all of their violence and destruction that they've created to, you know, allow themselves to create their cocoon, which is what his talk is about. Mm -hmm. and, and in that cocoon, dissolve all of who they've been to then allow those same elements to come back together and become who they're meant to be. And that guy is, you know, I'm going to go strong here, but is in many ways the personification of love. He wow. is acknowledged on the yard for being a role model for everyone, even the correctional staff who, you know, I believe have been trained to not, you know, kind of buy into the transformation. There's a lot of risk in that for of them. Of course there is, yeah. And so I know that one correction officer in particular, but others have, have told me that guy is a straight arrow. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and that's, and they, and the men themselves talk about the love that they feel for the very first time and how once they allow their hearts to open up and feel that, how it becomes this, you know, this condition that they want to share with everyone around them. And it, of course it starts with their kids first okay. and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, many of them have kids. And, and so they, it starts with their kids, with their families, with the other residents on the yard, with the correctional officers who, you know, for all intents and purposes live in that space too. Um, you know, and then beyond that to the greater community, these men are passionate about at risk youth and because they were them once and they understand that cycle of violence in a way that most of us myself included and especially could never understand and and they see the errors of their ways they see the brokenness in the system and they become passionate about being a solution to that system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's why how we come to healing society cycle of violence ironically it is with those who have perpetuated the cycle that we have some of the strongest and most powerful levers of change to actually heal the cycle. Those are the voices that are needed. Yeah. So I want to add, give you a moment to, to speak about the, your nonprofit. Um, because uh, I mean, you've talked about it, but what are you needing for that? How can, how can, how can people assist? How can people bring something to you with that? or for that? Thank you. Uh, so I would say first and foremost, just is something everyone can give, no matter who they are and where they are, is um, to allow yourself to step into your own brilliance. Mm -hmm. to, to engage in that exploration for yourself and to That's recognize the power about. and the gift that that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because the fact matter, people have said it different ways, but what this world needs is people that step into their brilliance. You know, even our U.S. presidents have said it. I know, you know, ask not what this country can do for you, but what you can do for this country. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. you know, countless quotes reflect that same truth. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's first and foremost. And then beyond that, um, I would invite, again, something anyone and everyone can do wherever they're at, to take the step and go visit your local prison. Go engage with that space. Go discover um, the humanity that exists in prison or, for that matter, in another group of society that, that you haven't engaged with. Uh, you know? and, and I invite all of us, because I'm a true believer in stretching our, our comfort zone, Mm -hmm. Because by little by little, by stretching our comfort zone, our comfort zone widens to really cover the world from personal experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and so if a person's a too big of a stretch, go 
say hi to your the person that's the homeless person that's living at the corner of your street. And, and, and little by little, allow yourself to, to, to do that stretch in coming into prison. And then more tactically for us, you know, we're always on the lookout for volunteers, for people who are connected and wish to connect in the space and, and grow our common mission and for um, funding. You know, this work, is, work takes place because of the people who, who have the heart to make it happen and then for with the people who have the resources to enable the people who have the heart, mm -hmm. and and we we definitely have you know have a you know already a growing army of people who have heart who are completely de dedicated who um, spend you know at least one time a week of coming into prison to engage not just with TEDx we have five different programs that we actively bring in there and we've brought five additional programs um, and supported other groups to bring their programs into Donovan as well you know because we're constantly an exploration of what can happen more deeply for Donovan but also now that we've learned some tr very powerful learnings where are they meant to go next so uh, given all of that, uh, because people are important, you know, how do we spread this? Um, and, and I'm wondering, this is a two-part question, I'm wondering if, uh, if you are available to consult with other groups who might want to bring this into prison. And then very foundationally, you know, any program needs funding to, to have it grow, to have it continue, but to have it really grow and take root. So um, I want to, this is probably not a question as much as a, an exhortation to our listeners. If, if you're part of an organization that hmm, has the wherewithal and, the, and you're feeling something sparking from inside, you're feeling some invitation from inside you, see how you could, could help, create, help create this, help support it. So, so I want, I do want the answer to your, to the, my question about, are you available to consult? And then will you tell people, share with people about how they can connect with you? Absolutely. So the answer to that uh, consult is the answer is yes. Um, we've, we are actually start, have started conversations in, in, in different places. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that to me is really exciting um, because you know, it's just, it's so powerful to see the transformation take place in one location. It's even more powerful when we start seeing it, you know, lights igniting in different locations because that's mm -hmm. how we little by little light up our world. And um, so absolutely for, you know, those connections and to connect with Burlington side, you know, that we, there's a possibility of going to our website and learning more, seeing the videos of our TEDx guys, you know, and as well as, you know, learning more about the programs that we deliver. And, and of course, there's as always a donation link there. And if anyone were to reach out directly with, for more information, the contact page on, on the website comes to me directly and can, we can connect that way too. So what is your website address? Brilliantsinside.org. Okay. Brilliantsinside.org. And that will be in the show notes, but it's nice for people to be able to hear that. Absolutely. And, um, Oh, there was something that just flew in and it flew out. Uh, hmm. Well, it seems to have gone. <laughs> if, if there were one, th oh, I know what it was. I want to ask you, when are you going to do your TEDx talk? Haha. -ha. Um, so <laughs> I, 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 I have given one in France, in French, last November. Uh -huh. uh, about, you know, the healing of our society's cycle of violence. And, um, and so for anyone who speaks French, that one is already online uh, right. and, and can be Googled um, with simply my name and TEDx. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, my, my belief is at one point there will come one in English that will be a little bit more. <laughs> and, um, and we'll see when, when that happens, when, when God has that in the cards. Great. Okay. Well, I look forward to it. And I'm sure our listeners will also be, you know, Saying, well, when's she going to do it? <laughs> Thank you, Mariette. I, your, your willingness to listen to what you receive and to then take the action, take the steps one step after another after another, that's that I want to highlight because you, we never know where those things are going to take us, whether it's something that is going to transform us or it's something that's going to transform the world. 
And usually, if it transforms the world, it's going to transform us. So thank you for your willingness to listen and obey. <laughs> listen and follow through. Yeah, thank you. I, I will agree to that, is that it, um, it's amazing miracles that are on that journey. Yes. Thanks for being with us today at Wisdom Talk Radio. Join us here regularly for more wisdom, discovery, and illumination of your journey. Remember, you can find us on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, Google, TuneIn, and more. And while you're there, leave us a review. And also remember, for more illumination and inspiration for your journey, find me, Laurie Seymour, over at thebacajourney.com. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us here at Wisdom Talk Radio. We wish you well in your conscious explorations. For more information and to join in the conversation, our website is wisdomtalkradio.com or at Wisdom Talk Radio on Facebook.